Today we've got a crazy Black Friday nuclear revenge story. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, co-worker tried to ruin my relationship, so I got him deported. People do the strangest things in the name of love. This isn't a fact that I'd like to dispute because I've also done my fair share of crazies. Seriously. You think there's a limit you won't cross until you look back and see you've crossed it a long time ago. To understand this revenge story, you need to appreciate the fact that nothing hurts more than being betrayed by the ones you love the most. The ones you put your trust in and know with absolute certainty that they would never switch up on you, well, until they do. This level of treachery awakens something in you, a side of yourself that you didn't even know existed, and all you'd want, or at least all I would want, is to hit them back. This is exactly what happened between me and my coworker Zane. He broke my trust, and not only that, he stole my girlfriend too. I couldn't have that, so I got him deported. But let me tell you the full story. I met my girlfriend Roxanne in my final year of law school. Before then, I'd only dated once in college. My roommates used to tease me all the time, calling me a prude. Because not only do I not date a lot, but I also can't get sexual with any girl I don't have any romantic feelings for. I'm demisexual by the way. My favorite thing to do during my time in college was to hang out in the library all day, geeking out on criminal law with some of the other students in my class. This had become a habit that I took to law school. Little wonder why my love life sucked. Anyways, the day I met Roxanne started like any other day. I left the lecture hall with some of my friends and we went to get lunch. When we were done, one of my classmates, Brian, invited me to his house to do a little studying. Now, I know Brian. The only time he would actually study was when he went to the library, which he rarely does, and the study session in his house was just a ploy to get me to come to a party. I declined and went to the library. I could never compare myself to Brian and the rest of my classmates. They were the most unserious, almost lawyers I've ever known. But still, they were all top tier students. For me, I had to dedicate a great portion of my day to studying to keep my position in the top tier. Anyways, I got to the library, picked out some tort law books, and walked to my favorite seat which was at the end of the hall by the window. Unfortunately, as I got there, the seat had already been taken. I found that weird because usually nobody comes to that part of the library. It was kind of secluded and that was what I liked about it the most. I was kind of pissed at first but when I moved closer, I saw her face. I'm pretty sure my heart stopped for a few seconds as I stared at her. Red hair, eyes the color of emerald gemstones, flawless skin. She was an angel. Suddenly I was no longer pissed. I sat on the chair right across from her, my heart racing with excitement. She looked up at me and then smiled politely. I smiled back and started flipping through the pages of my tort textbook. I wasn't able to focus and all I could think about was how I was going to talk to her. A few hours later, she checked her watch and started to rise from her seat. It was now or never. If I didn't talk to her then, I might never see her again. I dropped my gaze to the book she picked up. It was a textbook on immigration law. I quickly asked her what year she was. She smiled and told me she was in her final year. That broke the ice. I introduced myself and she told me her name was Roxanne. We couldn't talk for long though because we were in the library. Instead I collected her number and promised to call her. I left the library a few minutes after she did. I couldn't study anyways. I still couldn't get Roxanne off my mind. I called her the next day and asked if she wanted to hang out. She said sure and we met up at a cafe and just talked about ourselves, past relationships, and the differences between criminal law and immigration law. By the time I checked my watch, it was evening already and we'd been talking for hours. I walked her back to her apartment and we promised to meet up the next day. After that day, meeting up with Roxanne for coffee or lunch became a regular thing, and whenever we weren't together we usually talked on the phone. My roommates noticed that I started to spend more time on the phone and they teased me about it. Anyway, Roxanne and I started dating at the start of the final semester and it was great. It helped that we were working on different fields of the same career because she would understand whenever I complained about my lecturer or have to stay awake all night to finish a 25 page assignment. A few months later, we graduated. I was already working as an intern at one law firm in the city, so I moved into a new apartment closer to it. Roxanne also started to work as an intern in another law firm, 
Her workplace was close to mine, so she decided to move in with me. A few months later, Roxanne and I sat for the bar exams, and we passed. I instantly got recruited as a junior associate in my firm. That same week, the firm hired some new interns. I instantly took a liking to one of them. His name was Zane. He was from Pakistan or India. His use of the English language was perfect, but he liked to talk in a funny accent. We became friends almost instantly. On Monday morning, I got to work and saw Zane was already seated at his desk. He had a serious look on his face as he looked into a piece of paper. I knew immediately that something was wrong. I didn't say anything though. I went to my desk and started to do my job. Zane wasn't his normal self all morning and everybody else noticed it. During the lunch break, I walked up to him and asked him what the problem was. He waved me off at first, but I pressed further and he finally opened up to me. He told me that he came to the United States when he was a kid to visit his uncle, and since then he just never left. He was an illegal immigrant, and he had just received a letter from a friend of his who was also an illegal immigrant. He was arrested for going past the speed limit, and he was getting deported. I understood Zane's fear. If he made a slight mistake, he could also end up being deported. There weren't enough opportunities in his home country, and the best place he could be if he wanted a chance at career growth was the United States. Later that day, I told my girlfriend Roxanne what was going on. Since she was an immigration lawyer, she would know what to do, and yeah, she did. She was going to talk to some of her friends in the office the next day, and they'll figure out what to do. I didn't tell Zane about it at first, because I didn't want to get his hopes up, but a few days later... Roxanne told me to bring Zane and meet up with her in a cafe during my lunch break. I broke the news to Zane and he was overjoyed. Later that day, during the lunch break, we hurried down to the cafe where Roxanne was already waiting for us. We got a booth by the window side and the meeting started. I noticed something weird as Roxanne spoke to Zane. He didn't look as though he was listening to her. This dude was busy ogling my girl. I didn't mention anything to him though, I decided to let it go. It's just a one-time thing, I thought. We got back to the office that day, and Zane kept asking questions about Roxanne. At one point, I had to tell him point blank that she was my girlfriend if it wasn't clear to him before. That ended the discussion that day. One Saturday, that is, over a week since the meeting, I was lounging in the living room playing a video game when Roxanne's phone rang. She was in the shower, so I just let it go to voicemail. The person called again, so I checked the phone. I thought it was a call from her coworker or something, but to my surprise, it was Zane. Curiosity took over, so I picked up the call. I could tell that Zane was shocked to hear my voice instead of Roxanne's. He said he just wanted to know the progress of his case. I told him firmly not to call during weekends. She had been at work all week, and she needed rest. He apologized and hung up. I was pretty pissed that day, but I didn't mention anything to Roxanne. When she stepped out of the shower, I told her Zane called. She looked confused and asked me why. They didn't have any business together, till she could formally make a case for him. I shrugged it off and told her maybe he was just excited to get started. The next Friday after work, some of the workers decided that we should go to a bar to just blow off some steam. I wasn't interested, but Zane, along with a paralegal named Tanya, persuaded me to go. I knew it was a bad idea because ever since I joined the firm, Tanya had been hitting on me. She dropped subtle hints, but I usually pretend not to notice them. I called Roxanne and told her I was going to be late. We got to the club and after a few shots, I had decided that I'd had enough. Zane decided that we should play a drinking game. Naturally, I wasn't interested in the game, but since everyone else was playing, I was coaxed into joining. I was pretty drunk after that, and when Tanya asked me to dance, I said okay. It was all going pretty well, until Tanya grabbed me and kissed me on the lips. I know I was drunk, but I wasn't drunk enough to not recognize that she wasn't my girlfriend. I pulled back almost immediately and while everyone laughed it off, I told her not to try anything like that ever again. I left the club immediately and went home. I wanted to tell Roxanne what happened, but I didn't want her to worry, so I kept it to myself. A few days later, the next Tuesday, I came back home to meet Roxanne sitting on the kitchen stool staring at her laptop. She wasn't her usual cheery self, so I knew something was wrong. I thought it was something from work, but when I asked her what the problem was, she turned the laptop to me, and I saw what she was looking at. 
it was a picture of me and Tanya in the club. I was beyond speechless. I didn't even know someone took a picture. If they took it as a joke, they would have shown me, but they didn't. And how did they get Roxanne's email? I explained everything, but it wasn't good enough. She expected that I'd tell her the second it happened, but I didn't, which made me look guilty. I apologized and even though she said it was fine, she decided to sleep in a hotel. I couldn't sleep a wink that night. I kept tossing and turning as I tried to think about who would want to hurt me like that. My mind kept circling back to Zane, even though I didn't want to consider it. He was the only one that actually knew Roxanne. He had her number, he might have her email too. I hurried back to the living room and thankfully Roxanne didn't take her laptop with her. I checked the email address, but it wasn't Zane's. I wasn't convinced it wasn't him. Anybody could use a burner email. The next day, I watched Zane for the whole day, and when he left his desk to go to the bathroom, I hurried over to his desk. I checked his laptop for any evidence, but I couldn't find the burner email on the laptop, and I had to return to my desk before he came back. The next day, I asked to borrow his phone to call someone, and when he handed it to me, I quickly checked the mail. There, I found the burner email. I also took a look at his gallery, and I found the picture. It turns out, he took the picture and created a burner email to send it to Roxanne. I was shocked and confused. Why on earth would he decide to do that? I couldn't think of a reason why he would want to destroy my relationship with my girlfriend. I helped him with his immigration problem for crying out loud. That evening, I called Roxanne, then went to visit her at the hotel she was staying at. I explained everything to her and begged her to come back to the apartment. When she understood what was going on, she agreed to come back home. She also decided to drop the Zane case. She couldn't be helping someone that was trying to destroy her relationship. When we got home, she asked me if I was going to confront him. I told her no because I had something special planned for him. The next morning, as soon as I got to work, I called the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency and reported Zane's illegal stay in the US. Then I went on my day as though nothing happened. When Zane got to work, I spoke to him as usual and we even laughed and made a few jokes. A few hours later, the door swung open and the agents from ICE walked in. I could see the terror in Zane's face as they walked to his table. They flashed their badge, then walked him out of the room. Zane turned to me and yelled at me to call Roxanne. I merely smiled and waved as they walked him out the door. That was the last I heard from Zane. I guess Zane let their inner desires get a little too ahead of them. This whole time they should have been just keeping their head down and laying low until they could get some help. That said, our final story of the day is how I made Black Friday black for my husband. The year before my husband and I got married, I caught him on a date with his ex-girlfriend and high school sweetheart. That woman has always been like a shadow in my relationship with my husband. She was always lurking somewhere in the background. It was annoying. According to my husband's version of that story, they fell in love in school. She was a great above him, and her friends made fun of her, but she loved him anyway, and they stayed together. In her senior year, she started dating a guy from college. He said it wasn't her fault. Her mom wanted her to date him so they could continue dating when she got into college. What my husband's sister told me, however, was that he fell in love with a girl in a grade higher. He spent all of his allowances on trying to impress her and did it so well that she went out with him once. The girl had a boyfriend who was a jerk of sorts. He was also a grade higher, and they had an off and on relationship. Whenever the relationship was off, she would go out with him and they would have fun together until their boyfriend came again. And then she would go off with him, leaving my husband severely heartbroken. This went on for a while until she was in her senior year and her boyfriend went off to college. He came home one Christmas and they came back together again. That time, it looked like it was for real. My husband was hurt. He threw tantrums and attacked the guy. Of course he was beaten up, his sister laughed when telling me. She never liked him, but he kept lying to himself that she was in love with him. He had a huge crush and she took advantage of that. He was her permanent rebound. Did he even date other people in high school? No. He hung out with girls, but it was never anything serious. There was one who was crazy about him. He would go out with her until his crush came along and ruined stuff for them. I laughed. So he was doing what she was doing to him to another girl? We both laughed at the irony. 
I met my husband in college and we clicked from the first day we met. It was at a course mate's poetry reading. He was one of the poets and he was so cute. His hair shone in the spotlight and he spoke so well. After his performance, I walked up to him and complimented his poem. Thank you, he exclaimed with a big smile. What did you like the most about it? I said, what? My poem. What was your favorite line? I was embarrassed. The truth is, I barely even listened. I was more invested in watching him move his mouth and make eye contact with the audience. I said, oh my goodness, I feel very embarrassed about this, but I honestly cannot remember any line. I was barely even listening, just watching. They say, it's okay, I forgive you. You're not a poetry person, I assume. I said, I'm not. I'm only here to cheer for my friend. He smiled again and left. I remember thinking that I had blown it. He probably thought I was some shallow girl, but surprisingly he came up to me again and started a conversation. At some point we had to get out of the house so we could hear each other better. When he offered to drive me back to my aunt's home where I lived all through college, I took it immediately and informed my friend that I was leaving. That night he drove me home while we talked about different stuff, from poetry to art to his parents not taking him seriously as a writer. I told him all about wanting to be a stay-at-home mother to five children. He laughed at me. That's so old school. You don't look traditional at all, he said, his eyes twinkling. He may have found it different that a woman would have such dreams at the time, but he did look impressed. I said, you don't meet a lot of traditional women, do you? He said, no, I don't. I don't think I know any. My mom raised my sister and me all by herself. Dad? He said, dead. Sorry, I cooed. He brushed my shoulders with his palm. It's okay. He gave a reassuring smile and then explained that he'd always met rebellious women. I said, what's a rebellious woman? He said, I don't know, women who deviate from the norm? The opposite of traditional women? We had kissed that night before I went into my aunt's and he promised to call. It wasn't until he went off that I realized he didn't take my number. I knew he would find me somehow and he did. The next day he called me on my cell. He had gotten my number from a friend who was hitting on the friend I went to cheer on. We hit it off from there and started dating. All through college, he was my boyfriend. Now and then, his ex would show up again, but he would assure me that nothing was ever going to happen again. He wasn't going to let her do what she did to him when they were younger. At the time, she married the other guy and had dropped out of college. They had a turbulent marriage and each time something happened, she would reach out to my husband. My husband kept his promise of not letting her get to him anymore, all through college, but he soon got very close to starting an affair with her when we got married years later. The plan was to stay at home and raise our children when we got married, but I soon had to take up a job because we were having money problems. My husband's various writing jobs and painting couldn't sustain us, so I had to join him in contributing financially to our family. One day, I went through my husband's phone and I found a chat between him and his ex. They had been planning to meet up for a weekend and she asked him to do some shopping for her and he agreed and even told her that he had ordered different items and that they would arrive at our home the day after. I taught at a private school at the time, so I excused myself from school that day and lied that I was sick just to stay back home and receive the goods. But none of the goods came in. I waited all day but nothing showed up. I started to wonder if I had made a mistake. Maybe I had misunderstood the messages or maybe those messages weren't what I took them to be. I even felt guilty for snooping and was close to apologizing to my husband and mentioning what I had done. Luckily I didn't do that. If I had done it, I would have never have found him out. I tried apologizing for it anyway without making it look like I was apologizing for something. I made him his favorite meal and picked up after him all through that day without complaining about his bad habit of leaving his briefcase on the kitchen counter, dropping his socks on the floor, and his suit jacket on our bed. That weekend, I felt the need to snoop again. Now don't judge me, okay? If your significant other was getting messages asking him to buy her stuff, you're going to want to know what the heck is going on too. I waited till he was napping one afternoon took his phone with me to the kitchen and searched it thoroughly. I went through his private messages with his ex and I noticed that he had deleted the last messages they exchanged. The ones I read the last time I snooped. The last message in their chat was from him to her. He promised to bring the nice stuff he had gotten her with him when he was coming. She asked if he still had eyes for great stuff for women and he asked her to trust him. 
and reminded her that he always went shopping with his mother and was in charge of getting his sister's clothing because she was never interested in those sorts of things. He was right. My husband always went shopping with his mother. He knew what went with what and what colors and sizes flattered any women's figure. When we started dating in college, he went with me to the mall and helped me pick out new clothes. All the clothes he picked out were so much better than all the clothes I had. They fit better and went with my complexion and tone. I let him come with me whenever I was shopping for clothes. Even my aunt let him pick out stuff for her, and he always picked out nice stuff. He enjoyed doing that for us, so we just let him. When we got married and had our child, I stopped bothering myself by going with him to shop for clothes. I just let him buy whatever and he always got really good stuff. He had a great eye for shoes, clothes, and pieces of jewelry. I just know you'll love the stuff I got you, he told her in the text. I went all out for this one. I could not believe my eyes. My husband and I had several debts to repay. Our mortgage was there, and we barely had money to sort our bills, pay the mortgage, buy groceries, and pay for the basic stuff our child needed, and he was going all out for another woman? My husband loved shopping and had several applications for that on his phone. I wanted to check those applications to see if he had ordered stuff on them, but I also knew that he would get up soon and start looking for his phone. So I took his phone back to the room, determined to snoop again as soon as he falls asleep at night. I did just that and saw that he had taken advantage of the Black Friday sales and had gotten his ex-girlfriend lots of stuff, including a pricey necklace. He wanted to get her stuff, but also wanted to get it at a cheaper price, hence waiting for Black Friday sales. I was disgusted. It wasn't the fact that he was planning a weekend rendezvous with his ex that rattled me. It was that he was being very frivolous with money. Yes, I was hurt that my husband was cheating, but I didn't care much about that. I was honestly surprised that he hadn't cheated earlier. My dad used to cheat on my mom a lot and she knew about it. We knew he was cheating, the neighbors knew, everyone knew. And guess what? It wasn't just him. Nearly all the kids I knew growing up had dads who were caught cheating numerous times. In all these cases, the moms never left the dads. Yes, I had sort of normalized cheating. Maybe I would have thrown a little tantrum, but I sure as heck wouldn't leave my marriage because of some high school flame. I was still livid though because, listen, we needed money. Things were tight at the time. I hadn't gotten a new dress in a long time and my husband hadn't gotten anything either. We only focused on our son. Out of curiosity, I looked at his ex-girlfriend's Facebook. I wanted to know what she looked like. I was even angrier when I saw her. She had red lipstick on in nearly every picture. My husband always wanted me to wear red lipstick. I didn't like makeup, but I wore red on my lips on different occasions because my husband would get annoyed if I didn't wear them. I somehow figured he wanted me to wear red lipstick because he liked it. He wanted me to look like her. That may have been a stretch now that I think about it as an older, wiser woman, but the thought drove me over the edge. I thought about their texts all through the night. He was to receive the packages the next day, and I was ready to let all heck loose. My husband knew I wasn't one to investigate or question stuff. When a package comes in for him, I only ask what's in it, and I'm satisfied with whatever answer he gives. When it was delivered that afternoon, he answered the door. He'd been lingering around the living room in the front balcony area, and I knew why. As soon as I figured he'd be done signing, I came out to the front door and saw a big box. What is that? He said, oh, it's some supplies I got for my painting. I'm just going to take it over to the garage. I nodded nonchalantly and headed for the kitchen, where I took out a large gallon of gas and a lighter. He was still dragging it in when I caught up with him. He wanted to ask questions when he saw me, but before he could say a word, I poured the gas all over the box. He was shocked to see me that angry and determined to do something. Whoa, he exclaimed and stepped back. If you don't get out of here, you might catch some of this fire, I yelled at him, clicking the lighter and just throwing it into the fire. I hurried back to the house while he scurried around trying to put out the fire. It was just too big for just him to handle, so we ran back inside the house in confusion. Our child was four at the time, and she didn't understand the frantic running and yelling, so she started to cry. I took her upstairs with me and locked the bedroom door. To this day, I don't know how my husband put out the fire. I don't know if he did it alone or if he got help from the neighbors. He never admitted the cause of the fire to anyone either. 
Of course, he had figured out that I knew what he was up to and whom the package was for. He begged and begged that I never divorce him. I told him I wouldn't, but he didn't believe me. He was too scared after watching me start that fire. He offered to go to counseling, but I refused. We'd already spent and burnt so much money. I didn't think we needed counseling. My husband reconnected with an old flame and he got distracted. He tried to escape our current reality by buying her stuff and playing sugar daddy. He needed a jolt back to reality and I did that by literally making his Black Friday purchase black. All I can say is OP sounds incredibly more forgiving than most people would. The whole cheating, the whole buying all this stuff for your ex. Not something that many people would be willing to overlook or move beyond. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another absolutely crazy story of revenge, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.